It's not just about not slamming. No, you're, you're the man. You, you ask the questions. All right. Mm. And well, well, it'll be fun. You won't cry bet. I'm, I'm, I'm not far from Walters or, you know. You don't ask me what, uh, it wouldn't be a tree. and uh, What kind of tree would yeah, you? Yeah, right. Yeah. I, I was a huge not slamming fan. You were? I was. I was that, yeah, I'm, I'm one of the people, I and mean, my name wasn't Nielsen, so I apologize. <laughs> I wish it had been, we'd still be on the air. Yeah, it was a great show, though. Um, I'll, let's just dive right in. You, you were not the first person to play Gary Ewing, were you? No, David Aykroyd. Um, David did a two-part episode on Dallas that aired, I think, in 78. Um, and I knew David. David and I worked together on a soap back in New York, Another World, back in... 70, um, the heck was that? 76, 76, 76, 77. I can't remember which. Then I'd seen David on the Universal a lot, actually, because I was doing a Rockford and he was, he was walking by and he said he'd just done a, uh, two part episode on this show called, and I couldn't remember, I think it was Dallas, he said. Um, and they were talking about doing a pilot spinoff from that. And I said, ah, great, man, great. And then when it came to do the pilot for Knots, he was busy with, I, Think Little Women, uh, which was a, mi a miniseries, and he wasn't available, so I had to re recast that role. Cut break for you, huh? And he, you know, I didn't know. <laughs> hey, how did uh, how did you get involved with with Knots Landing? Oh, I just went for an audition. It was just another audition. I didn't really think anything about it until a couple of weeks later, my. My agent said that he was busy, uh, he was uh, making a deal with these people, uh, and I said, what people? And he said, you know, that thing, Knott's Landing, and I, I couldn't even remember it, because I, at that time I was young and I was doing a lot of auditions, um, so it was just one more audition. The mean anything. When, um, when you got the part, how did it work? Did, you, did it start off as a Dallas episode and then? Yeah, we did a, a Joni and I went, we'd already done all, I think we did 13, including the pilot, because we were a mid-season replacement. We'd done all of those, and then Joni and I went and did a um, uh, an episode of Dallas that introduced the characters uh, again, actually. Um, and then the following week, we aired. Uh, and um, Patrick Duffy had been in the pilot, I believe, um, to, he'd like gone with us to California because Miss Ellie had bought this house for Gary and, and Val in this cul-de-sac. And that's how it started. It sort of it, it, it sort of was the uh, the the parent becoming the child of 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 the offspring in a way, wasn't it? Knots Landing was supposed to be first. That's right. Knots Landing was first. Um, David uh, Jacobs, the creator of both shows, had uh, had come up with the idea for Knots Landing, and um, I think C CBS had said that uh, we need to make it. Yeah, we like the idea, but make it more sexy, make it more about power, and da, da 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 da. So he came up with the idea of Dallas, and once Dallas was on the air, then he said, "Okay, how about Knots Landing?" And they said, "Yeah, great, cool." So you and you and Joan Van could work together, pretty. Right? <laughs> yes, uh, we'd done an episode of Wonder Woman together, and um, that was the silver condom episode. I I, I wore this. It was this, we were both people from the future who had come back and I had on this silver spandex suit that zipped up the front and it was, it was just absurd. Um, and I had, but I had known of Joan before, before that. I knew who she was because, um, Joan's from Boulder and she'd gone, uh, she's from Boulder, but she'd done work in, in Denver at a, a it was a community theater called the Harold Bonfils Community Theater. But it was like no other community theater you've ever seen. It was um, it was as good as any professional theater I've ever been in. It was extraordinary. Um, and Helen Bonfies was one of the owners of the Post, if not the owner of the Post. And she also was a Broadway producer, along with uh, Morty Gottfried, I think. And um, so Joni had done a uh, show there, a play there, called Another Part of the Forest. And there was a picture of her back in the green room um, because they had pictures from the people of different productions and. Um, um, I was sitting there with a guy named Barry Laurie, who who had a, a public relations firm in, in Denver. And we were doing a play together under the Yum Yum tree, of all things. And he was talking about Joni and saying, you know, look, she's in, now she's on Broadway and blah, 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 blah. And uh, so I knew I knew who she was. Uh, and by the way, Barry subsequently became uh, head of publicity for uh, Columbia and uh, some other uh, uh, film studios. Right. Pretty amazing. 
Yeah, I mean, you know, there are only 250 people in the world. <laughs> you keep meeting them over and over again. Right, right. You know, but that was interesting. I, mean, the, I remember, I mean, yes, being the person who watched Nod's Landing and then seeing that episode, of, I'm like, you know, was there any other connection? Did you guys become friendly at that point? Was there any connection? Was there? Was it a sheer coincidence that you guys got cast opposite each other in Nod's Landing? Oh, yeah, completely. Um, and, no. <laughs> I always tell the story and she hates me and she counters with the story I'm going to tell afterwards. But the story I always tell, which is true, um, when they cast, when Lorimar, who was the production company at the time, it was, it was since been absorbed by or bought by Warners. But um, when Lorimar, when we did the pilot, they cast Joni and I's husband and wife and they were, they took it to CBS. CBS said, well, they were concerned that maybe Joan was too old to, I mean, I was too young to play her husband. I mean, there's only about a three year separation. And, um, and Lorimar said, no, it's okay. They worked together before. And, and CBS said, oh, okay, fine. Now, Joan's counter to that is, yeah, yeah, but when they came to me and said that they were casting Ted as, as Gary, I said, no way, he's as crazy as I am. It'll never work. <laughs> so, Are you both crazy? She is. Yeah. No, I'm, I'm very sane. <laughs> That's why I'm an actor, right? Yes. Yes, right. That's a very sane choice, isn't it? The sanest, the sanest group of people in the oh, world. Oh, absolutely. As a general, as a general yes. rule. Very, uh, very egalitarian, very caring of other people. Right. Yes. That's why we're just sitting here and we're going to talk about me for an hour. Yeah, right. To love <laughs> you to death. <laughs> um, well, walk me through those first couple of, first couple of months on, on this uh, landing. What was, as this was first, your first big series, I guess, wasn't it? Oh yeah. I'd done daytime in New York for a year and then I came out here and I'd done some pilots and guest stars and, um, yeah, but I, you know, we did 13 episodes and I, I figured that was it. I, I really, I mean, it took a number of years before I realized that we were probably going to run for a while. I'm every year I would ask Every year, without fail, I'd ask Michael Feinerman, who, who, along with David Jacobs, was the, were the two producers, I would ask him, I said, so, uh, I think we're going to buy a house. What do you think? And he said, yeah, buy the house. And then it was, uh, I think we're going to uh, add on to the house. What do you think? Add on to the house. So I, every year I asked him to get picked up, because you never knew. I'm sure you just never knew. And our ratings were kind of, they weren't ever bad, but they were just sort of kind of in the middle, not really going anywhere until the twins thing and then that that's the and then we were number one for the week that that year nice to name your kid after your brother who didn't really die right i know i know yes you're right and nobody touched that you know nobody i mean what are you gonna do everything had started unraveling then so nobody nobody said anything that is the stupidest thing i've ever heard of i'm in the shower i had a dream what was your thought when it when it, i thought that's the stupidest thing i ever heard of what are you gonna do i mean you it's like it impacts so many different storylines that if you acknowledge it, it just all unravels. I mean, it's a very delicate tapestry we weave anyway on television. So you take one little thread out of there, the whole thing just falls apart. So nobody touched it. Nobody said anything. Nobody did anything. <laughs> that Excuse was the me. last of the crossovers, I think, calls it. I don't, I can't remember, you know. I, I, I don't can't. think you guys did a sing after that. Well, we may not, I'm true, I'm sure we didn't, but I'm not sure we did too many. I think I only did about three or year four crossovers. That's right. But that was that was that was pretty. But I think that's when I said, okay, you know, they ask you to suspend your disbelief, right? And then they ask too much. I think yeah. you know uh, they're asking you to constitute that poetic faith just a little too much. <laughs> <laughs> um, that's a rough thing. But you guys, you guys, the evolution of Knott's Landing was was over the years as people came and people went. Um, do you want to talk about that a little bit? Because it was just, it was just, there was, the cans just grew and it was, it was expansion and contraction. Well, it has to. I mean, when you run that long, um, w what happens is you got your principal actors and you pretty much, they pretty much run the gamut in terms of stories and conflict, et cetera. So you've got to bring in new blood, as it were, to, to have new conflict so that they can deal with that. And that's, that's essentially what it is. You just keep bringing more and more people in and, and cycle them in, cycle them out. Uh, what was the atmosphere like on the set? What was the, what was, you know, every set is a little different. So. Uh, it was great. I mean, it was a great place to work. I, you know, we were together 14 years, so we, we went through, a, we went through a lot. Um, uh, everybody went through a lot of personal things and sometimes we brought it on the set. Sometimes we didn't. Um, uh, 
But I have to tell you, we really hung together. Uh, we really hung together. It was pretty remarkable. Could you walk me through a production week just from a creative and production standpoint? Like what was, you know, every show has its own part, you know, especially like sitcoms, just you show up for work and you go for a week and you're done. Something like, like that's land and curse for the folks who don't, who, who don't live through something like that. When, that the- well, that guy was essentially it. I mean, that's essentially television. You just don't have time to do anything. You don't have time for rehearsals. You don't have time to do anything other than shoot the show. So they're pretty much relying on you as a professional actor to know what you're doing here. Um, you know, 90% of directing is casting. Um, if you cast the right people, you don't have to do anything other than the camera positions and everything as a director. Initially, we started out where we would have, we'd be doing one episode, and then sometime during the filming of that episode, we'd have a cast read of the next episode. We'd have lunch and then read, read the, the next script. Um, after a while, they stopped doing that because we made fun of it a lot and they didn't like that. And I can't blame them. It was rather cruel and stupid of us. Um, but we would do that to get kind of a sense of what it was. Um, but for the most part, um, you get your script a week or two in advance, and um, they were always amenable to changes, always. Um, if, if there was something in there that you just didn't feel right about or whatever, you could take it to them and say, what do you think? And they, they'd either change and fix it or say, no, here's why we want it to be that way, and they give you reasons. And it was a very collaborative process, and it was a, a, quite a luxury. It's not done that much anymore. Uh, it's pretty much whatever we say you do, uh, which is, which is fine. You know, it's their show. They can do whatever they want. Um, but as an actor, it was really great. It, it, it gave you a lot of leeway. Um, and then we'd, um, you know, we'd start production. You'd end one production maybe at lunch and then the next, then after that, you'd start the next production, um, which didn't really matter because it all, it was all the same, same character, that kind of thing. Um, and there were minimum 12 hour days and, uh, Although we shot a lot longer than most people. Um, we were there sometimes to midnight, one o'clock in the morning on a Friday uh, when they could do that because they didn't have to worry about turnarounds. Um, so, I mean, it was, for, sometimes there were long days and sometimes not, just depending on how uh, involved in the story you were. About the last five or six years, I, none of us had a whole lot to do. So you'd work maybe three, three days out of the week. Um, which was great. <laughs> Paying you an awful lot of money. And, uh, you know, you could, I mean, I went to Germany a couple of times. I, I went to Europe. It was, you know, all during production. So, I mean, it was, yeah, it was great. How did you like change once the planting came on the air? Oh, well, I could get a seat in the restaurant pretty quick. Um, uh, a lot of things changed. Um, I mean, you make a lot of money. Uh, um, and, um, and if you're smart, you bank it. Yeah. Then you buy homes and, you know, cars and all the material things. Um, and then I don't know, you, <laughs> things happen. I mean, I got a divorce. I got remarried. I'm still married to the same person. Um, and, uh, just a lot of things. Everybody goes through life changes. And that's not to say you wouldn't anyway. It just seems when you're in the, when you're the public eye, those changes are really magnified um, and become, I think, a lot more important than they are. So you, you attach more importance to them and you get more crazy about them. And, uh, just one thing leads to another. One per- <laughs> person I interviewed said, I don't like people looking at me all the time. Well, I, yeah, I understand that. I mean, I'm, <laughs> Like this a lot. So do I know this person? Why are they saying hello to me? <laughs> exactly. Um, what are some of the stories, you know, the anecdotes, the stuff that, that, you know, you come home from work one day and say, God, you can't believe the thing that happened on the set today. Is there anything like that that, uh, and most people come home from work and something happens at work. When you come home from work, it happened on the set of Not Slandic. You know, there wasn't much of that really. Um, it wasn't that dramatic a set. We were all pretty, I mean, no actor is centered. If they were centered, they wouldn't be working. Um, it's, it's the ones who were off center are the ones that work. Um, but, but it, you know, given those parameters, it was, it was, everyone was fairly centered. So it wasn't really crazy. Um, I mean, we had a lot of fun. What, 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 kind, of, what kind of things would you do to blow off steam during downtime? 
send your love. Oh, it was pretty. It was very profane. Very profane. Um, I mean, you know, we'd all be brought up on sexual harassment charges now. You couldn't do it now. Um, you just couldn't. Um, my, I, I did a, I had a shower scene, and and uh, Donna was off camera, and you know, and the, I think it was cutting me right here, and I said, oh, the "Hell with it." So I just, I did a nude, and uh, Donna was like, <laughs> "Um, I, it's just just to break things up." I remember once I had a. Uh, one of the times Gary was drinking and he got thrown in jail, then he has to go into a detox center. I decided I'd stay up all night just to see what that was like. I think it was about the time, it wasn't at the about the time that Marathon Man had, 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 uh, been released. It was a few years afterwards, but there was some story about Dustin Hoffman and, and Lawrence Olivier when they were doing the scene in Marathon Man where they were extracting his teeth and Hoffman had been up for 48 hours straight in order to do that scene. And. Olivier had said to him, hey, why don't you try acting, dear boy? It's so much easier. And uh, I talked, I was, remember talking about that to the director, Larry Ellican, um, who passed away last year, actually, who was an extraordinary director. He was terrific. Um, um, and we talked about that. And uh, he said, why don't you do that? Stay up all night. I'll, I'll protect you. I'll, you know, I, and I trusted him, and he did protect me. And um, yeah, I'm just so I stayed up all night. And... Uh, I was nuts. I mean, it was just nuts. I was like this. Uh, but the work was fascinating. I found the work kind of interesting. I found what I did was kind of interesting because I went so far with it um, that, um, I mean, it went right to the edge of overacting. <laughs> it may have gone over, I don't know. Um, but that, I, I found that really interesting. Uh, what was your perception from the inside? I mean, after you saw it, I'm sure you had one perception, but what was it like going through it? And then what was it like seeing what you did? Well, going through it, I mean, you're just crazy. You know, you, you're sleep deprived. You had so much coffee that you're just, you know, totally on edge. And uh, it doesn't take much to put you over, which is, which was fine because the, the character was insane at that point. He was detoxing um, and you get a little nutty when you're detoxing. Uh, so that, that was okay. I, I thought, okay, this is all right. I can ride this out. I'll, I'll be okay with this. Um, and then watching it, um, Watching it, I thought, well, okay, I, that works. I don't want to do that again. I think, I think maybe I will try acting again, you know, rather than this sort of thing. Um, I mean, I certainly don't want to do it well, too old. For that. I was much younger and could do those sorts of things. things that, um, how did your castmates react? Who were, you, who were you doing scenes with at that point? Were you just on your own or were you? Uh, I think uh, it was with, with Donna, actually. Uh, Donna was cool. She was fine. Donna, go with whatever you give her. Uh, she was great. She was great. A great cast. You just had a really great cast, and they all sort of, you got a sense that there was, um, whatever the backstory was, you got a sense that these people weren't just friends on, on screen, but off screen. No, you know, people people ask me, so did you hang out together? No, we were we spent 12, 14 hours a day together hanging out. Why, why would I want to go hang out with us some more? There's nothing to tell. You've told everybody your life story 13 times. Why? What's the point? But, and we did. We all got along uh, extremely well. I mean, I've been on other sets where people don't get along, and it's not easy. It's, it's the atmosphere that's created is um, not, not good. I could. So uh, we got along, I, I think, extremely well. That's right. You also, over the years, there were some great, great guest stars, people like Ava Gardner. Or Ava Gardner, I got to tell you, man, she was extraordinary. There was a scene with Doug Sheehan and myself, and I think it was Kevin, when we're, where we're, the three of us are standing here talking. She walks in the door and says, does anybody have a light? And we said no, and she says, oh, well, nobody smokes anymore. I'll go somewhere else. Just in that, you looked at her, and it was, I mean, I, you know, my legs got weak. Uh, it was... That is one of the sexiest women I've ever seen in my life. And she was 65 at the time. She was just extraordinary, extraordinary. There, there's some women who carry with them the whole time. Ah, she did. And, on, and, and before she came on, I'd, I'd, I'd seen her movies before, but I watched them anyway. I, as an adult, I watched them. I watched Barefoot Contessa, and it was... Um, um, it's with the world. How about Julie Harris? Julie was lovely, just lovely. She... Julie was the one, all you had to do with Julie was just learn your lines. That's all you had to do. You don't have to worry about acting, you don't have to worry about anything. Learn your lines, show up on time, and whatever she gives you, 
you take it and give it back. I mean, acting is reacting, and she gave you so much. You just you had a, a, a grocery list of things to choose from in terms of your reaction. She was extraordinary, and and just uh, I mean, she was like she was like Spencer Tracy. You know, the whole thing about Spencer Tracy is that he he was so naturalistic, and that was that was Julie. Julie just you know she's an extraordinary actress. Yeah, there's certain people when you see them and they. They fold into their role. Yes, they so fold. Deep. Exactly. They fold into the role and they become the role. And it's just, they're just talking. Yeah. And then you see them into something else and you're like, wait, that, that, that's right. the same person. Right, right. Exactly. That's, that's Hank Azaria. Hank Azaria is like that. He's unbelievable. I mean, I saw a film the other day. Uh, uh, what was that film? Oh, was that the film? I can't remember what the film was, but he played a French Oh, on came Polly. That's what it was. Okay. And he played this French uh, beach bump. And I didn't know it was him. I mean, I, everything he does, you think, can Hank Azaria? He's amazing. Yeah. It's truly a character. Actually. Yes. Uh, how about Alec Baldwin? Alec, yes, Alec. Alec is one of the great mimics of all time. People don't know that. He could do a Brando like, oh, you've never seen a Brando done like, like Alec does. In, in the... Um, in one of the, um, um, what was it? Uh, it wasn't Patriot Games. Is the one before that that Alec did, um, where he played Jack Ryan. Right. Uh, anyway, and that the one was with Sean Connery. Um, he does a very, is a very brief scene. He's crawling through the pipes or something in the submarine, and he and he he's making fun of Sean Connery. Sean Connery was the Russian captain, but he's doing Sean Connery. It's very brief, but it's dead on. It's a dead on Sean Connery. Alec is a great mimic. A great mimic. And a great actor. I mean, he's a terrific actor. When he was on the show, I thought, and this is true. I never said this about anybody, but I did say this about Alec. I thought, this guy, is, there's something really special about him. Something's going to happen with him. Well, yeah, there was something. He was sort of acting. He was on, almost on another show sometimes. <laughs> 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 well, that's, here you that's guys, good or bad. I, here you guys <laughs> are on Knott's Landing, and he's on a whole other landing. <laughs> Some people, some people hit a different plane. That's true. Yes, <laughs> I heard he would do whole scenes as Brando or as. Like, he may have. I mean, I didn't. I think I only had like one scene with him, um, uh, and we didn't even have any words. I just, I walk into the house. I'm supposed to shake his hand, and I didn't shake his hand, and he was, like, one of these things. Um, so I, I don't know, but I do know he was a great mimic, and he did a great Brando. That's amazing. That's amazing. Let's talk. Let's talk back. Talk to. I met William Devane, and I was just like, "Wow, he's just—he is what he is, isn't he?" What was what was it like? <laughs> he just. What does that mean? What? You and Kevin Dobson, you walk in, you. No, I was there. Yeah, Bill. Bill probably came in with a t-shirt and boots and <laughs> not just and horse shit all over him, right? <laughs> dirty t-shirt, and I said, "Would you like a room to change?" He goes, "Why?" Because <laughs> what's wrong with this? I'm like, "Got it, okay." That's that's Bill, yeah. And he was great. Um, what was what was he like to work with? He's great. <laughs> I mean, as you know, he's a very naturalistic actor. So uh, it was always I, I didn't have I had hardly any scenes with him at all. Uh, but I, I I watched him a lot, and um, it, it, it comes from this I think the studio mentality where they always have, always have an action to do while they're doing the scene. Um, and with him, it was cigar or eating an apple or peeling an apple or something. Um, which, which makes perfect sense. And it's a great thing if you can, if you can use it because if you're concentrating on doing that action and the whatever comes out of your mouth sounds much more real and more naturalistic because you're, this is where your concentration is rather than here. Um, I, I just, I don't like to do that because I always worry about ma matching. So, you know, but movie actors do that a lot because they don't, they don't do much coverage. Uh, it's done shot very differently in, in television. It's, it's a master and then where you, the master is the beginning and the end usually, and then the selling is in the is in the coverage. Uh, and you always have to match stuff, and I'm always worried about that. But Bill is a terrific actor. I mean, my God, is thought I went through a lot of apples, a lot of cigars, <laughs> cigars. Yeah. What a good excuse to smoke. Come and say, my character spoke. I have to smoke these cigars. Absolutely. Props. <laughs> um, Kevin Dobson. Kevin's terrific. Um, Kevin was always fun to work with. Um, we had a, I don't know, he probably told you this scene where you had a, a, a speak no evil, see no evil, hear no evil. Did he tell you that? Oh, I think he mentioned, tell me. Yeah, there were three of us in the scene and, and, and we wanted, we, you know, you do this long enough and you do get bored. Uh, you, uh, 
So at the end of the scene, you try and figure out how, you, how each one of us can, one person to do this, one person to do this, one person to do this. Um, so at the end of the scene, you just, you, some, somebody be like this and somebody be like that. And the first would be like this. A little in jokes there. Yeah. You know, <laughs> as long as it didn't detract or anything. I understand. Just, well, did you throw in any other in jokes into the, into the show as time went on? Oh, probably. I just, I can't remember them. Um, if it escapes me at the moment. What was it? Uh, did, did you, I know people sort of transitioned to the other side. Did you ever direct any episode? No, no. I'm an actor. Uh, directing is adult work. <laughs> You have to know something to do that. Um, some of the some of your castmates, uh, yes, did some directing. What uh, was it like when when they moved to the other side of the? Well, game? Joni and, and uh, Michelle directed. Uh, um, I can't remember. I think Bill did too. I can't remember. Um, yes. But Joni and Michelle, were terrific, and they knew exactly what they wanted, and and uh, they knew the characters, and they knew the emotion and that kind of stuff. So it was it was interesting. It was very interesting. And fun, fun. I'm, I bet, bet. So. You guys did a reunion movie a while back, too, right? Yeah, I don't. Uh, yeah, we well the movie where yes, that but that was done in ninety five. That was a while back. Yeah, it was about ten years ago. So what what made them decide to do the reunion not as a movie but as kind of a special? You know, I don't know. Uh, be, well, cheaper. Well, it's certainly much cheaper, and they had to pay us much much less, uh, and I mean much less. Um, uh, <laughs> uh, but Dallas had already done a reunion and they, they had a success with that. So they wanted to, uh, it seemed natural, to, I suppose, just to do a, a not slanting reunion. Um, but it's just, uh, it's a lot of this talking to the camera and talking to each other and that kind of thing. Yeah. And, and clips from the show. Yeah. And also, I mean, essentially it's about, gee, who had work? Who didn't have work? Uh, oh, they're fat. Oh, they're too thin. Uh, that kind of thing. Oh, they age well. Oh, they look really old. Uh, that's that kind of pretty much the same. Yeah, right. No, you do. No, I don't. No, I've, you don't. I've seen pictures. No. <laughs> you know, I think eyes age. You know, you go to a you know, high school reunion or something like that, and you see people from years ago, and you go, "What? Well, if they haven't changed all, if they haven't gotten fatter or lost hair or something, you go, "Oh, you look exactly the same." Whereas you know that really they kind of people age. For oh, them. yeah, right, right. Yeah, we all age. Some some better than others. That's some very well, yeah. eventually. Uh, what do you think uh, the character? What is Gary Ewing doing today? Do you think? I have no idea. I always stayed out of that. I I, I don't. I, I know there is an acting exercise where you you figure out what the character is doing before, which actually has some validity to it, um, in order to have a backstory in terms of how you're reacting in that present little window. But to do what happens afterwards may, has never made any sense to me. Um, there's just so many variables involved. And I mean, if you look at your own life, it's... So he's dead. Never. He could be, uh, you know, he could have gotten drunk again and wrecked a car. Who knows? Mm -hmm. Who knows? And uh, did you keep any memorabilia from, from, uh, that's lightning? Um, uh, so I have, I have, well, I have, you know, the magazine covers and stuff like that, but if they're all in a box somewhere, I, you know, I have a director's chair that they gave us that storage said, right. that kind of thing. No, but there's nothing up in the Inside house. the magazines, put them on eBay, make a fortune. Yep. <laughs> Let's talk about some of the crossovers with, 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 with Dallas from when they could do the crossovers. Cause sometimes people came to, to your show. Sometimes you went to the other show. Um, what was, what was the logistics like? Was it difficult? Was it easier? Did you have to shoot too many, too, you know, double the, you have to double the work those weeks? How did that work? It was just a scheduling thing, really. Um, I think since I was down in. Plano just once, uh, Plano, Texas, where the Ewing Ranch was. Um, I mean, other than that, we're on the same lot. Um, and it's just a scheduling thing more than anything. Uh, but they worked it out. They figured it out. It wasn't that difficult. You just had to walk over to the other lot. Yeah. No, no, it was the same lot. You had to walk over to the same, same soundstage. It was, it was pretty simple, actually. That you could have crossed over without scheduling anything, maybe. Well, no. 
<laughs> to, you know, you, what am I doing on this set? Yes. Yeah. You have to juggle stuff. Right. Kind of stuff. Um, I'm going to be interviewing uh, Charlene Tilton next week. What should I ask her? I have no idea. Okay. I, I mean, I, you know, I didn't have that much to do with Dallas, really, so I don't really know what went on on that show. Uh, um, I don't know the storyline. came over so. to your show a couple of times. Yeah. Those were, but that was really in the last first two, three years. And then, and then we, everybody, we were established on our own. We didn't really do that much. Um, and I never watched Dallas, so I have no idea really what, what went on there. When you did the uh, reunion show recently, I assume there was some conversations that you had with other people during the show. Mm-hmm. Uh, is there anything that you learned during that show that you didn't know when you were doing the original show? No. Oh. I don't think so. What else is perception? Uh, no, I think I think everything. No, I no, no. not at all. No, I, I knew everything. <laughs> well, we, we were so, you know, we were so close for so long. I was you weren't going to get away with many secrets on that on that set. It was pretty obvious who was doing what and when and where and to whom uh, or how or you know any of that stuff i mean it was and nobody was doing anything to anybody on that set but uh, you know i mean there were things that went on that everybody was pretty much pretty much aware of but uh have you watched desperate housewives yes i have that's a man i i watched three television shows i watched carnival until they took it off the air i'm sorry to say uh i watched 24 and i watched desperate housewives uh, desperate housewives is a hoot it's I mean, really, if you were going to compare it to Knott's Landing, which you really can't, uh, but if you were, uh, Desperate Housewives is a satire of Knott's Landing, which is fabulous, because we always wish that they could have, that they could have just aired the, the outtakes rather than the show itself. I mean, we, we just had a ball doing stuff, just messing around. And then uh, you get to the end of a scene and, and you know it's dead, but they're letting the camera run, and before they say cut, everybody would say something. I mean, just utterly profane um, that, you know, you crack you up and you move on. Hey, you're dealing with some, something so melodramatic, you've got to release that tension. Um, at least that's the way we looked at it. Uh, what were the gag reels like? Profane. I keep saying that, don't I? Profane. It's a great word. A lot of swearing and um, sexual innuendo and just filthy stuff that we, I'm telling you, we'd all be in jail. <laughs> Keep me if they did it today. I understand. Did the uh, did you get a lot of network notes? Those come down from on high. I don't think so, but I don't know. We weren't privy to that sort of thing. Um, and if we did, they didn't say this came from network. You have to do this. I don't recall that ever happening. Actually, I, I, one of the reasons we felt we ran so long is that uh, CBS just forgot we were there. I mean, you never saw promos for it. It was never, yeah. It was just kind of there Thursday nights at 10. Um, you had a couple of different show openings, I noticed. You mean credits? Well, the credits, yeah. Right. You want to talk about the different ones? Because it's like, first you head to the whole thing, then you have the boxes going by. Had the what's going by? Boxes, little boxes. Oh, going right. By. Then, right. You know, and then, that's... Yeah, and then you had the different action shots, and then you had the sort of daytime thing where we all kind of went like this and looked at the camera and that kind of thing, which we all hated that one. So, um, uh, you know, credits are the credits. As long as they spell my name right, that's all I care about. Did they have any other room? No. Okay. Where we? <laughs> really for it. Um, talk about some of the other, couple of the other co-stars to mention very briefly. Uh, Donna. Mm. Tell me about Donna. Donna was like a day at the beach. I mean, Donna was terrific. Donna knew, she knew her character, she knew what that character would do and say. And, you know, what you saw was what you got. Uh, she was terrific, great to work with, really, really great. Michelle? Michelle was uh, very much the same. Um, yeah, Michelle sometimes would go out here and come back again in order to get to the character. Um, but it doesn't matter how you do it, as long as you get there. And she always got there. She always knew what she well, Listen, everybody on that show was very professional. They knew what they were doing as actors, and they knew what their characters were. And they knew everybody has a different way of, you know, arriving. It doesn't matter how you arrive, as long as you arrive. And everybody did. I read somewhere, and if I'm wrong, let me know, that the, uh, that I guess maybe the 200th episode, 
you guys were allowed to do some improvisation. Yes. Yeah. What uh, what did what what how did that come about, and what did you do for your improvisation? Well, what how it came about was <clears throat> Constance McCashin's uh, character Laura uh, dies, and then so everybody goes to the I guess the wake afterwards at um, mm -hmm. Devane's character's house. And David Jacobs had camera. It was at his at David's house, and he had cameras all over the place. And we just improved what we would be saying and doing. Um, I hated it. <laughs> I couldn't stand it. Um, it made me nuts. I don't. I don't like improv. Uh, I think improv is an interesting exercise uh, when you're maybe trying to uh, reach the the limits of that character. How far would he go? How far out can you go? And then you pull it back. But as a, and, and we, this was just, by the way, the improv was not aired or anything. It was, it was just from, from that improv, they wrote a script. Um, but I, I just felt very uncomfortable doing it. I, I, I need, I need parameters. I need, I need, uh, I need to know where I am. And within those parameters, I, I can be very free, but I need to know what the rules are. And, and there are rules with improv. Um, I, I just, I, I didn't like it. It was very uncomfortable for me. Very what difficult. Did, what did you end up doing? I can't even remember. I blacked it out. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, I mean, everybody just talked about Laura and what a wonderful person she was. And she isn't it too bad she's dead. And how's, how's Greg Sumner? That was his name. How's uh, Greg doing? And, you know, and that kind of thing. And how oh, is that a nice dress you have on? And yeah, I, uh, silly stuff. <laughs> Pretty much stuck to the script other than when, when you could. Well, there was no script. Uh, in general, generally, I'm most, most. Oh, yeah. I, I pretty much mm. deal with what they write. I, I'm not a writer, I'm an actor. It's not my job to write. I don't, I don't know what I'm doing when I'm writing. It's no good. I love the acting. You can seem to nail that part. I, you know, I'm a big believer in know what you can do and do that. Mm -hmm. uh, you've done some guest starring mm -hmm. roles over the years. Um, what were some of your favorites? We know the silver condom. That one we know. <laughs> um, I did an episode of um, John Larquette's show, um, which was great. It was a, it was based on the Larquette's character was a, was a drunk and he sobers up, but he, during a blackout, um, I I'm a character that comes on the show that says I'm here to make amends because I'm also in, in the program and I'm a but and one of the amends I have to make is that you know. Um, I'm gay and that we were together and, and you know, one thing, it, it, nothing happened, but Larry Cat doesn't know that. So, um, I, it was very funny. It was, and I know John, and I've known him for a long time. So it was great to do the show and, and, uh, to do that kind of comedy. It was wonderful. I really enjoyed that. Um, and, the, and I did a movie in, uh, in Toronto, this is about 10, 12 years ago that, um, with Mel Harris, that was, uh, Fabulous script. I mean, it was really good, uh, really interesting. A thing called Spider and the Fly. That um, it was a really interesting whodunit kind of thing. You just you weren't sure up until the very end who who was the bad person. Uh, it was really it was great fun. Unfortunately, I remember my whole my whole mo during that was: Am I going to get through in time to get on a plane from Toronto to Copenhagen because that's where my wife is and my wife's Danish and we have where well, she was over seeing the family and I was going to meet her over there for Christmas because this was almost right up to Christmas. But it was, it was a great script, great script. But that's soap. Soap. Soap I did right after uh, the first 13, that we'd done the first 13. I think we, we'd started that in December before Christmas. And during the filming of that, um, uh, I'm, I'm an old, how does it work? I can't remember what the storyline exactly was, but I'm an old friend, a uh, boyfriend of... Uh, Becky Balding, Rebecca Balding was the actress, uh, and she was supposedly with Billy's character. I think she, I think she'd had a baby with Billy, even though Billy's character was gay. Uh, um, and, uh, and and which is really odd because Rebecca and I had known each other ten years prior to that, doing melodrama in Durango, Colorado. Uh, anyway, it's another story. I'm not even going to tell it. Um, 250 people in the world. Well, yeah, exactly. 250 people in the world. So anyway, Billy, Billy during the scene, Billy wa run, goes out the door and slams the door. Well, when he slammed the door, he cut off part of his finger. And we couldn't finish, finish the taping. So we had to come back after Christmas and, and do it again, really. Um, 
but it was an interesting character. It's, all, it's the only time I've ever gone on an audition where I knew I had the role when I walked out the room. Because this, this guy was, um, he was sort of a electric uh, horseman, drugstore cowboy kind of thing. I mean, he had on the, the shirt and the leather pants and the boots with the silver tips and the silver heels and he talked like this all the time. Um, you know, it was just silly. It was silly. It was fun. It was great fun. Who did the casting of that show? I can't remember. Can't remember. Why do you know? I don't know. Could it have been uh, Jay Savage or who? Uh... I don't know. I remember it was a couple of women, I think, but I, I can't remember. It sounds like a fun, uh, sounds like a fun gig, though, other than the fact that you had to come back after Christmas. Well, it was great. I got to come back. I got paid again. I... <laughs> Not a bad thing. I love that. <laughs> Uh, how do you like uh, doing uh, the sitcom thing as opposed to the? Uh... It's it's a different uh, it's a different discipline, really. Um, you know, you go in, you have the first day, and everybody meets, and you have a table read through, and that's it. You go home, and then the next day you come in, and you kind of go through the block, kind of get the blocking down, and then in the afternoon you do it again, and then you go home. I mean, to do to do a half hour is uh, you can have you can have pretty much of a real life because your, your hours aren't that long. Um, but it can be really nerve wracking, uh, when it comes to tape day, because you got an audience out there and, uh, you've got to really be on top of it. And the problem with that I find is who do you play for? Do you play for the camera or do you play for the audience? Cause you've, if you play for the audience, then you're going to be too big for the camera. If you play for the camera, maybe the audience isn't going to get it, but, and then they're not, the response isn't going to be what maybe it should be. But then you have to let that go and say, that's not my problem. I'm, I'm the actor. They, they got big applause signs out there that say applause, and they have big signs that say, you know, you know, laugh and that kind of thing. So I don't worry about that. That's, that's fair. I, I try to play for the camera. Well, sorry, that says shut up now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> exactly. That's funny. Um, what did you see? Oh, you did a Twilight Zone. I did. I played a priest. I did that in uh, Toronto. Mm -hmm. I can't remember what the storyline was. I think it was about a, I think before the guy became a priest, some woman gets killed and some girl he's dating dies in a car wreck or something. And she keeps reappearing uh, now that he's a priest. I can't remember what it was. Uh, let's see. Well, everybody did Love Boat at some point or another. I, yes. 16 days I was on that, um, on that boat in the Caribbean. That sounds like hell. Well, yeah, it wasn't because I was working. Um, I, I, you know, I've, I've been in some hellacious places working, but I was working, so that mitigates a lot. Um, but to be on a boat, not working, just on a cruise, uh, uh, for 16 minutes would be too long for me. It just, I couldn't do it. I just couldn't do it. And, you know, those cruises are all about keeping you on the boat because that's where you're going to spend your money. Uh, and you've never seen so much food in your life. I've never seen so much food. Uh, 24 hours a day, whatever you want, anytime. It's extraordinary. <laughs> oh, craft service is good on the, on the love. Uh, yeah, yeah, it was, it was. I mean, I had a good time. I had a good time doing it. I, I, yeah, Joe Rigoboto, Joe Rigoboto and I did it. I'd known Joe because Joe had been on the show. He played the husband. Uh, actually, Joe's the one of the, Joe's the guy that stole the twins. Uh, so... I, I knew Joe from that, and um, um, right. Joe and I did the the, uh, the love boat, and Joe was in, uh, we were gangsters, I think, and we were out to steal something, and Joe had to be in drag the whole time for some reason. And um, we had this scene where we had to get on these, um, their ski things. I can't remember what the name of it is, where you, it, it's like a, Instead of sitting down and driving it this way, you have to stand up and drive it this way. Well, that that looks pretty easy, but in fact, it isn't. You have to you have to start out lying down and get the the engine up like this, because it's like a motorcycle. And then you pull it up, and then as it and then as it pulls up, you have to stand up with it. Well, it took a while to get to get us to do that. And Joe's in drag doing it. You know, he's got a dress on, high heels, <laughs> corset, stockings, you name it. And and when we filmed it, it's the two of us like this, and up above us is a helicopter. That's where the filming is, from the helicopter. And, it, and he wasn't that far away, I might add. And Joe and I did it on one take. We couldn't believe it. Couldn't believe it. Stunt, the stunt guys that were on the show were just ecstatic. <laughs> so, so that was great fun. That was great fun. It felt like a lot of fun. What, is there a story over the last however many years that you've sort of dined out on, the one story that you've 
you told your friends or your family, it's, you, you know, this is the one, this is the one. Yeah, <laughs> not really. Uh, no, I, I think I pretty much told you, I mean, I, we could, can't really. I was talking to the guys from My Three Sons, and they said there was an episode where there was a lion on the set, you know, and all of us, I spoke to Don Grady and Dan Livingston and Gary Livingston, and they're all, and there was a lion that there was the the lion wasn't supposed to be in the house and in the in my three sons' house. The lion got loose on the set. No. Well, and ah, uh. so, so every and they didn't know where it was because it's like here. No. This big, wall, big dark set. <laughs> they didn't know where the lion was, and they were all sort of sitting there and like, okay, everybody, people are quiet because they didn't want to open the door. Right. To let it. And. Uh, so everybody be quiet, let the lion come and sniff you and do what it needs to do. And then they heard the lion down this hallway to get it to the holding pen. Of course, William Frawley was in the bathroom at the time. And, and didn't know? No. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> and comes out of the bathroom. And apparently he's a very loud guy. He's like, and they said they could hear it. They're sitting there going, shit. Can't please. So they hear him. Dun, 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 dun. <laughs> Holy shit. <laughs> and he turns around and he goes running back to the men's He's room. running. He runs back. And it's just the thing you're not Exactly. To. You don't want to run he from runs, animals. He right. runs back to his dressing room, slams right. the door, gets on the phone and says, you know, there's a lion loose in the set. These are the story. We had a pigeon fly in once. <laughs> <laughs> Uh-huh. That was in a scene between yeah, Joan and... Yeah, that's, that's gonna, we're going to leave the show with that one. That was it, man. That's the only one I can think in terms of animals. <laughs> uh, but there's all, you know, I mean, it's like everybody's got something. But, so, so I thought if there was anything, but that's a, that's kind of a big one. That's a big one, yeah. That'd be hard to top. I can't really think of anything. I mean, it, I'll, I'll leave here and I'll think of 37 different that's stories. Everybody but comes yeah. up with their best stories from the drug Right. Oh, I just... Yeah, there's like freeway scenes. You, you work on a scene all day long and you just... You know, you're, you're almost there, and eh, okay, they'll print it. There's nothing you do about it. You're driving home on the freeway, and you think, ah, that's what I should have done. Freeway scenes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I'll think of something. I, I just, I, nothing, oh, nothing comes to mind. welcome to come back. <laughs> okay. Did we, did we miss anything? Gee, I don't know. Do we miss anything? Well, you know, Joan's got a wooden foot. What? Yeah. yeah. No, I'm joking. I know I you are. I could cut it right away. <laughs> but I'm like, I, I, I was prepared to go with you on it, though. Well, I... I was pre pre prepared to let you take it as far as you wanted to go. Well, you stopped me. Oh, I stopped so myself. Stopped just, uh, right. Yes. No, no wooden foot. Yeah. I think of it. I know. I think everybody's, you know, everybody's got all their limbs and toes and fingers, and um, everybody looks really good. That was the thing I was kind of surprised about when we had the reunion is that how, how well everybody looks. And Donna looks exactly the same. I mean, everybody says, you know, you look exactly the same, but Donna really does look exactly the same. She's got extraordinary genes. Her. Extraordinary, and she looks pretty good in them too. I must say, that's an awful thing. Don't print that. You can't print that. I will print that. Okay. Never, never. It will never happen. Ted, thank you so much. Thank you. This was a lot of fun. For no, me. I enjoyed it. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure. Thanks.